Hello, my friends, and welcome to Momentum Boost. I'm your host, Adrienne Gold Davis, and I'm so delighted you're with us today. Now, if you want to ask our guests a question that's simple to do, you just click the question mark that you'll find in the lower left-hand side. But remember, all of the questions are visible to everybody. So if you wanted privacy, all you have to do is click the hand icon. So in this episode, we're talking about God asking and answering the questions that challenge us. I mean, does God really need rebranding? Truly, is God some old guy with a big white beard in the sky with his finger on the smote button every time you make a mess? I don't know, but I think that we're gonna get to the bottom of it some way today because we are so honored to have Rabbi David Aaron and Sarah Hurwitz here with us. Rabbi David Aaron is the Dean and founder of Israelite and he's the Rosh Yeshiva at Yeshivat or Oraita in the old city of Jerusalem. He's a spiritual visionary. He's a master educator. He's a spirituality expert, and he's the author of eight books. And if that's not enough, we have the fabulous Sarah Hurwitz, who was Michelle Obama's former speechwriter, but she's also the author of Here All Along, Finding Meaning, Spirituality, and a Deeper Connection to Life, in Judaism after finally choosing to look there. I'm just delighted to welcome the two of you. Thank you so, so much for joining us. Well, th well thank you. I'm very excited about this. What an incredible opportunity. I, it's I, great to be here. Thank you for having us. You, you just, you have no idea. It's such an honor and a privilege for me to work through these things. And I know that the audience has many, many questions about this. God is a term that is rarely heard in Jewish life, unfortunately. We could talk about that too. But before we begin, we have to define our terms. So my first question, and how about if you start, Sarah, is before we get into any of this, talking about God stuff, what do we even mean when we say the word God? Such an easy question. I mean, why, why don't you start with something hard? Come on. Oh. <laughs> no, it, it is a great question. And I think Something that really moves me about Jewish tradition is that we seem to have this profound humility when it comes to God. But I think we understand that we are talking about something far beyond the limits of our tiny little human hearts and minds to fully grasp or define. So we don't have some very simplistic image of God or some simplistic definition of God that we say, this is what God is and we know it. Yeah, that's a form of idolatry, I think. Instead, what I see in my own studies of Judaism, which are far far less vast than the rabbis. So I, I'm very much interested in his answer, but we see rabbis, thinkers, and theologians articulating different conceptions of God throughout history based on their own experiences and their understanding of Jewish tradition. So we have mystics who say that everything is God. You're God, I'm God. The idea that there's a barrier between us, that's an illusion. You have Martin Buber who says that God is what arises between two people in deep human relation, fully contemplating each other's humanity and being vulnerable to each other. What arises between them is God. You have Mordecai Kaplan, a Jewish thinker who says God is the process by which we each become our highest and truest selves. And so many of those conceptions resonate with me. You know, I, I don't think that God is a being who can intervene in our lives, but I do relate to God as a being. I relate to God as a you, because again, I have a very tiny little human brain and heart, and I want relation with whatever this is. You know, if I were a tree, I might have a different name for God, right? Trees have a different way of, of relating. But I think while I see diverse conceptions and understanding of the divine, I do think there's an understanding that God is not neutral, right? This isn't some neutral force. And this is something that calls us to live our lives in a certain way in response. And I think that last part is really important because I see a lot of kind of new age spirituality that's about being all spiritual and feeling close to God. That's not the point. <laughs> the point is to live a good and worthy and decent and loving life in response to whatever that is. So I appreciate that Judaism really emphasizes that latter part because I, I think that's what matters. Interesting. Rabbi Aaron, what would you say to that? Great. Right. Well, I, I'm uncomfortable with the word God uh, anyways, uh, the truth is the word God is not found anywhere in the Torah because the Torah is written in Hebrew. And uh, and then we suddenly slap this word on, which means God. The the Hebrew term that is being translated as God is a Hebrew word that is the Hebrew letters Yud, He, Vav, He. It's referred to as Shema Havaya. 
The word Havaya is the Hebrew word for existence. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I agree with atheists. When an atheist says there's no such thing as God in existence, I agree. There, there is no being over there that's in existence. Actually, what Judaism is saying, that God is existence and infinitely more. So the, and we always add infinitely more because we have to realize that everything we're saying is always relative to us in the language that we can understand. So we always have to put in that, you know, infinitely more. But the truth is, you know, the new age concept of the universe, talking about the universe loves us, pray to the universe, in many ways is actually much closer to Judaism than the normative understanding of God as some uh, male figure somewhere in heaven who's, who's, who's out to get me. But rather, what I think people are intuiting about the universe is they, they sense that there's an all-encompassing reality that I exist within and I'm a part of. And, and so to me, I, I don't like using the word God, but I, it's a bad habit. But uh, for, to me, what we refer to as Hashem or the name yud heh vav -He, is the all-encompassing reality, the all, the whole. Not the whole that's the sum of the parts, but actually the whole that all the parts are unf unfolding from. And therefore, I believe that the whole is no less intelligent than I am because I'm a part of the whole. And you can't have an, an intelligent whole with intelligent parts. And I believe that the whole is loving because I'm loving, and you can't have an unloving whole with loving parts. But basically, yeah. for Judaism, when we say Hashem, or if we're going to say God, then in the deepest sense, we're talking about the all-encompassing reality. We are talking about the all, the whole, not the whole that's the sum of the parts, uh, and not even the whole that's greater than the sum of the parts. Actually, the whole that precedes all parts, and all parts are partial manifestations of that whole. What is redeeming about the word God is that really God is the personification of all good. And that essentially, uh, you know, people make the mistake to think that Judaism is a theology and we're going to study God. You don't put God under a microscope or find him in a telescope. But rather, God is the personification of all good. If a person says, look, I don't believe in God, but I believe in good. I'm committed to good. I want good to rule the world. I'm dedicated to serving, to bringing more good to the world. Guess what? In our books, you're what we call a believer. Just hold on one second, though. But that good can be a very subjective thing, correct? I mean, what is perceived as good in one culture is very different from another. If I say to you, I'm a good person, why do I have to believe in God? Whose definition of good are we talking about? Okay, well, first of all, uh, I, I think one of the reasons you have atheists is because they feel that God is actually the enemy of good. That many people have done terrible things in the name of God which is really why we need to do this rebranding because you have a lot of very beautiful, wonderful people that are atheists that are committed to love, peace, truth, justice. And, uh, and they think that they're not believers. Actually in our books, you're really a believer. A person says, I believe in God and in the name of God, they spread hate and they break laws and they do evil. You're the one that doesn't believe in God, even though you say it. In our tradition, it's not about what you say, it's about what you do. Now, in terms of what is defining God, I think that would be another discussion that we should have in terms of is revelation uh, a, a possibility and what is the point of revelation? Okay, this is very, it's beautiful and it's heady and it's complex. And I'm not entirely clear. I have to say, honestly, I'm not entirely clear. Um, Sarah, yeah. do you think you can be good without God? Oh, absolutely. I agree. I, I, I mean, everything Rabbi Aaron just said, I very much agree with. Right? Like, I think you can absolutely be good without God. I think that's totally, totally possible. But I, you know, I really like what Rabbi Aaron was saying about how, you know, God is not a noun. I think God is closer to a verb. I think God is something that you choose. I think it is much less about believing or not believing in a thing and much more about opening to an awareness of something that calls us to behave in a certain way. I just think that's how I would re I would shift it. You know, I, people always say, well, what if you have a crisis of belief and someone told you God doesn't exist? I don't even know what that means. That there's a man in the sky who doesn't exist. That, 
that's just sort of nonsense to me, right? I think it's about opening to this awareness that there is something beyond ourselves, something bigger than just us. And, you know, I, I also get that argument about atheism a lot, where it's like, I can be good without, without believing in God, of course. But the follow-on argument of religion has actually caused many of the problems in the world, uh, not quite right. Uh, you know, Stalinism, not a great movement, millions of people died as a result. That was a wholly secular movement. So I'm not super fond of the intellectually dishonest kind of atheism that claims that atheism is somehow has a lower death count than religion. That's not true. So I, I want to push back a little bit on that idea. Okay, Rabbi Aaron. I, I, okay, so Sarah, you said something at the beginning. You said you don't believe that God intervenes, as it were. Yeah. So then why would we pray? Mm. Rabbi Aaron, what's the point of prayer? I mean, I personally have had instances in my life which I have called Hashkacha Pratis, or HP as we call it on Momentum, where I actually feel that there has been a kind of intervention. And I don't feel like I'm deluding myself, but there are others obviously who think that. Can you speak to the whole idea of Hashkacha Pratis, of higher power and of intervention as you see it existing or not existing? Yeah. Well, I do believe that there is intervention but uh, I go back to what I said, if I believe that God is the all, in fact, in Kabbalistic tradition, there are Hasidic Rebbe's that would refer to God as the all, blessed be his name, the all. Now, if, if when we say God, we mean the whole, which is not, again, not the sum of the parts, not even greater than the sum of the parts, but the, but the all that all the parts flow from are facets of, then mm -hmm. if I'm caring, that I have no reason to believe, I have actually every reason to believe that the all is no less caring than I am. And if I'm intelligent, then I have no reason to believe that the all would be any less intelligent than a part of himself. And therefore, I do believe that, 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 that Hashem, God, does guide us and, uh, and, and cares about us and does communicate to us. But for me, that communication is the communication between, you know, if, if, if we were a part of a tree, well, then in this metaphor, we'll say that God is the root and we are the unfolding of that root. And I believe that there is some kind of exchange between the root and its branches. And so I do experience uh, HP, that's a new one for me, uh, <laughs> HP uh, in my life, uh, but I don't experience God as some... Um, being somewhere over there, uh, you know, like for instance, I, I say to my students, look, I, I don't know what gravity is. I've never seen gravity, but I know gravity is in my life when I feel a force pulling me down. And I've never seen God and I don't know what God looks like, but I feel God in my life when I feel a force pulling me up. Ooh. And so when a person feels that there's a calling and they feel an uplift, and they feel deep inside that I couldn't be here for no, for no reason. To me, that's an indicator that you are living with the presence of God, even if you don't even use the word God, even if you don't believe in God. You are a person that are under the influence of a higher power that is calling you to greater order and, 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 and becoming a greater version of yourself as part of a greater self which is what I would call God. Okay, that's gorgeous, oh. but how does that scare, square away with the idea that God seems to be angry and punishing in the Bible? How do you believe that God is good when you see such bad qualities? Sarah, can you take that one for a minute? Could I actually just weigh in on your last question? Because I think that's that was really important. You know, I think that a rabbi I love named Ellie Kaunfer once said, you know, when we pray, when we pray, when we ask for things, when we express ourselves and our hopes and fears, you know, he doesn't necessarily, we don't necessarily know whether we're gonna get what we want. It's not like an ATM where you push something in or you ask your parents for the candy bar. But when you express your needs, your vulnerabilities to another person, even if they can't give you what you want, you feel closer to them, right? You feel heard, you feel accompanied. And I think the closeness maybe is the reward, not necessarily getting the thing that you wanted. I think there's really power there. I also yeah. just think, you know, this idea of God is the all, I know it can feel a little bit abstract, but I, I love what Rabbi Aaron is saying, because I think if I think that God is truly everywhere, then when I walk by a homeless man on the street, that man is a manifestation of the divine. You know, when I look at the plants on my balcony, those are being, those are infused with the divine. You know, I think you can really see the world in a very different way. 
Um, you know, in terms of the God as, you know, in the, in the Torah as this angry and punishing God, you know, I personally believe, and this is, you know, just personal belief, but I, I don't believe that the Torah was written by God. You know, I re- believe it was written by human beings about 2,500 years ago, compiling earlier oral traditions and laws. They may have been somehow divinely inspired. Um, and I think that the God depicted there reflects their ancient understandings, their perceptions, right? I think that God is a, is a character in a way that, that that's not, I don't think that's God, right? I also think over the last 2,500 years, we've been interpreting this document. You know, we don't put out each other's eyes because our ancient rabbis said, no, 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 that's not what an eye for an eye means. It means that if you put out my eye, you need to compensate me, right? We, we've been understanding this. So I think that, you know, we have over the centuries from our ancient rabbis to today, we've sort of grown and changed in our understanding of God. So I don't think that that God character in the Torah is the last draft. I think it's sort of the first draft and we've been iterating on it and understanding it ever since. And I think it's much more in the realm of metaphor and poetry. You know, reading the Torah literally, like you're not getting it. That's not how it's meant to be read. And we've never read it that way. We are an interpretive, thoughtful people. So I I don't think you can take it literally like a shopping list or a textbook. It's much more in the realm of poetry and metaphor. Well, I want to say something. This is a uniquely momentum experience we're having right now because, you know, one of our, our goals is unity without uniformity. And one of the things we have to learn is how to be able to respectfully say to someone we love, I disagree with you. Sarah, I disagree with you. I love Go you so it. much. I totally disagree. It's such an interesting thing. And I think that this, this is powerful because uh-huh. everyone's voice is being heard, but we're yes. both free to say, no, I don't agree. What do you think, Rabbi Aaron? Well, first of all, a, a, a lot of people, you know, what, what I think should be on the front of the Torah, of the Bible, yeah. Yeah. is don't read this book. And underneath it, learn it. Mm-hmm. It's not a book that's meant to be read. It's a book that's meant to be contemplated. Now, one of the mistakes that people make in there, nobody tells them the game rules of how to open this book up. They think this book is describing who God is. Uh, We cannot describe who God is. We cannot describe who you are. I cannot describe anything as it is. I can only describe it as it appears to me relative to me. And therefore, everything that the Torah says about God is not there to describe God as he is, but how God appears to me as I am. If I'm doing something really bad, then prophetically God will appear as angry at me. But I know that he's not a man or a person like me, and I know that the prophetic image is there not to give me some theological understanding of God, but some kind of ethical understanding of myself, that I'm so off that in my connection to the all, the all appears in a metaphorical image as if angry. I know the all is not angry at me, okay? I just know that that's how he appears. You know, Carl Jung has a very beautiful teaching, and he himself says that he was very influenced by Kabbalah. He says, I simply believe that a part of the soul transcends time and space. Now, we would say that differently. We would say we simply believe that the soul that transcends time and space, a part of that soul is in time and space. You and I and everybody else in this world is a part of a soul that transcends time and space that is in time and space. And there's a dialogue between me in time and space and my higher self that I share with the universe beyond time and space. Now, when I'm off mark and I'm doing things that is not aligned with myself, with my higher self, then my higher self will prophetically appear to be angry. And I know that this is not how he is. It's really there to teach me how I am and that I need to change. But most people read the Torah and think it's a theological text, which is describing God as he is. The Torah is not a theological text. It's an ethical text. It's a text that is meant to help us become the best we can be. And so when people start getting into philosophical discussions about who is God, this is not what Judaism is interested in. Judaism is interested in who are we. But in order to understand who we are, we need to understand that we're part of that which is much greater than ourselves. And there is some kind of dialogue between the self within time and space, and the greater self that we share with all human beings beyond time and space. So imagine if I were to have a dream, and in my dream, I would see a picture of a a king very angry at me and, and rebuking me. 
And then I go to a dream therapist and I say, what is this? He says, well, this is your higher self. And because you are feeling and you are acting in a way that's not aligned with your higher self, then your higher self appears poetically as an angry king. But nobody thinks that the dream is an accurate description of, wow. it's really an accurate description of where you're at. No, not who God is. So Sarah, I, is that what you mean, Sarah, when you say um, it's metaphorical? Yeah, it is actually. I think that was a much more sophisticated and, and deep explanation of, of what I meant. And I also, you know, I think that did that, distinction between defining and describing God is so important because we don't speak in definitions. If you say to me, well, Sarah, tell me about your grandmother. I don't tell you, oh, a grandmother is the mother of one's parents. If wow. you say, tell me about your vacation at the beach, I don't say, well, a beach is a, ge a geological formation where the ocean meets. That's not how we talk. I would tell you, I love my grandmother. She was a passionate blah, blah, blah. I would tell you the beach was sunny and windy and warm. Like, this is not, and so, you know, all of this energy we put into defining God, does God control this? Is God all powerful? Why does God allow bad things? All of this stuff doesn't make sense, right? It's so much more about describing the divine in Jewish tradition. You know, a rabbi named Elliot Dorf, and that was actually, that idea came to me from a rabbi named Bradley Shavit Artson. Another rabbi named Elliot Dorf wrote a beautiful little piece where he said, you know what, in my life, People relate to me in all different ways. Some call me a brother, a husband, a son, a father, a board member, a professor, a friend. How much more so it must be between us and the divine, right? We all have our own unique relationship with the divine, depending on how we perceive the divine. So to come up with some, so, so I really agree with Rabbi Aaron, this is not a document of theology, of attempting to systematically define the divine. It, it's something very different than that. So I think that's a common misunderstanding. And I really, I appreciate how Rabbi Aaron makes that distinction. Thank you. Wow. Wow. Okay, so on a very fundamental level, this Torah that we're meant to study and not read, these laws that we are taught the ways these mitzvahs, these connectors that are supposed to connect us to the divine, to use your definition, Sarah. How does that work? Can you explain to me this principle of physical behavior somehow impacting spiritual outcome? I, you know, here's my question. If I if I have a, my, my roommate and I tell you, oh, my roommate's great, I love her, I care so much about her, and I tell her, you know, you're great, you're such a good friend, I really care so much about you, and I just really, really love you very much. And then when she's sick, I don't bring her food, I don't take care of her, I ignore her, I'm too busy. Do I really love her? Well, I haven't acted as if I've loved her, so I think we would say, no, you actually don't love her. You were just paying lip service before. So I think that, you know, when I think about the mitzvot, the commandments, the, you know, the Jewish laws that sort of indicate how, what we should be doing, both ethically and ritually, you know, I think these are ways that we express our, our love and that we reflect our sense that we're serving something higher. You know, I think if you look at these, these laws, they're trying to cultivate certain characteristics in us, kindness, decency, compassion, wisdom, self-restraint. You know, and, and some of them don't make a lot of sense, right? Some of them you're like, really, we shouldn't eat pork? Why? It wasn't because of trichinosis or anything like that, right? There's, there's, we don't know why. But a, a rabbi named Jay Michelson once said, you know, yes, I don't eat bacon. And yes, that's stupid, but you do stupid things for those you love. I think there's something to that. Wow. What say you, Rabbi Aaron? Well, um, I believe that the mitzvot are directives. In other words, let's say I was feeling down and, you know, lack a lot of energy and I go to a therapist and I say, I don't know, I'm just not feeling great. And he says to me, well, let me take a look at your latest art. And I say, art, uh, uh, you know, doc, I'm not, I'm not an artist. He says, no, I can see in your soul that you are an artist. You need to be painting. You need to be in a studio with a canvas. You see, the, the goal of Torah is actually not to be a good person. That's a mistake people make. Before we do a commandment, we don't say a share asanu tov. It doesn't say you have made us good people through your commandments. It says a share kidishanu b'mitzvotav. You have made us holy through your commandments. Now, what does it mean to be holy? And why would anyone want to be holy? 
it was spelt wrong. It's supposed to be W H O L L Y. You've made me a whole person. Now, the, the goal is to be whole. That is all we all want to be. I just want to be totally who I am. Now, who am I? I'm part of a greater self, a whole that I share with all of the universe and every human being. And I want to be wholly, completely who I am and the part I play as, a, as, as, as part of this greater whole, this one self, that we're all facets and manifestations of. And so I see the mitzvot, you know, the, you know it says, Derech Eretz Kad Torah, that a person has to be a mensch, a, a, a basically good human being, humane, before they even get to Torah. So you could be a very good person, but not a whole person. You know, you're doing good things, but are you living the totality of who you are? as part of a greater whole that you're part of. So I'm a part of a whole, and a whole part is part of a whole. And I believe that the mitzvot enables me to live that part of my, that part I'm supposed to play. And I believe you got lots of people that are good people, and they don't necessarily have ever even heard about Judaism. And that makes sense because we are taught that people are meant to first be humane even before they get to Judaism. But Judaism wanted to take the world from not just simply being good, but also being whole, a total you. Now, you, you could be good without being whole, but you couldn't be whole without being good. Whoa, Sarah, what do you say to that? Yeah, I really, I very much agree with that. That idea of wholeness of, you know, I would, I would maybe refer to it as a divine spark, right? That with, you know, I think in secular context, we talk about being who we're really meant to be, you know, fulfilling, actualizing our potential, fulfilling our highest self. You know, I think that's a great secular way to talk about this, but I think you can talk about it in a spiritual way, which is finding your divine spark and really living out and reflecting your divine spark. And I, I do think that that is very much what, you know, what in my own experience, what Judaism has helped me do. Okay, so if we were rebranding God, pretend you're marketing experts, what might you say to the world? How would you want to introduce God 2.0 to a skeptical crowd, new and improved and the same as always? What might you say? You know, I don't know if I could come up with a great slogan or bumper sticker, but I think that what I would want to do is maybe start with experience because we make the mistake of starting with theology. God is all powerful or not, omnipotent, you know, and it just becomes this heady argument that you just push people away, right? And no one, no one can really win this argument because no one really knows. I think what I want to do is start with experience and just say, forget about all the, the theology. You know, think about the moment when your child was born, when your parent took their last breath, when you were standing out in nature and just so awed by the scenery around you, when you hurt you you know, experienced a piece of art or music and you just felt blown away. One of those moments that, that you just felt transcendent where an insight came to you almost as if outside your conscious mind. We all, even the most adamant atheists, we all have these experiences that feel transcendent, that feel somehow just not of the everyday world. There's something about them. And what I've discovered in my own learning is that you know, there's a lot of Jewish thinking and theology that locates the divine in those experiences. So when I'm having that moment of intense relation and vulnerability with another person, suddenly I find Boober who says, wait a second, what's happening there is actually a manifestation of God. It's like, oh, wait a second. So I, I think I would urge people to just you know, think about beginning with experience and, and building from there rather than trying to you know, impose some theology or definition of God onto people. Beautiful. And Rabbi Aaron, to, to correlate with that, let me just ask you this. Why do you think it is that we Jews don't even talk about God? It's not perceived as a Jewish thing. You, you, you almost never hear Jews talking about God. Christians talk about God. Right. Well, you know, the word for word in Hebrew is teva, which also means box. Another word for word in Hebrew is mila, which means to cut. And another word for word is uh, davar, which means thing. So yeah. really, we've just discovered that language uh, boxes, cuts, and turns the abstract into things. And therefore, by definition, talking about God is actually a desecration of what do we actually mean when we say God. 
And it's as silly as talking about the color red. I really have nothing to say about red. I have no question that I know red, but I can't describe what it looks like. And if I was blindfolded and somebody put in front of me chocolate ice cream and someone said, what flavor is that? And I say, that's chocolate ice cream. And they say, well, could you describe that, please? And I would say, well, actually, I can't. Well, then how do you know it's chocolate ice cream? How is it different from vanilla? Well, the fact that I can't explain something doesn't mean I know it. The fact the deepest things I know can never be explained. Oh my. That's why it says in our tradition, Ta'amu v'ru'u ki tov Hashem. Taste and see that God is good. Not study, not explore, but it's a deep experience. And for me, I experience God as the greater self that I share with all of mankind. And the goal of Jewish life is not to understand God. And the goal of Jewish life is not to obey God as some guy in the sky who's telling me what to do. The goal of Jewish life is to live God into the world. To live God into the world is to live into the world a life that indicates that we are all sharing one soul. The Zohar says, describes the divine as the soul of our souls. So the metaphor I give is, you know, in, the, in my room right now is an air conditioner and, uh, and also a light bulb. And uh, let's say in my room is also a kettle. They're all connected to the same self. That's called electricity. Now, when electricity flows into the air conditioner, the power of cooling becomes manifest. That would be the soul of the air conditioner. And when electricity flows into a light bulb, the power of lighting becomes manifest. That's the soul of the light bulb. And when electricity flows through a kettle, then the, heat, the power of heating becomes manifest. That's the soul of the kettle. And therefore, you know, if we were all appliances and we'd say, hey, do you believe in electricity? We wouldn't be able to have this conversation without electricity. So I believe that we share one self, one field of consciousness, one soul, and that each soul is a particular manifestation or a limited partial manifestation of the souls of all souls. And every appliance wants to do the same thing, to serve in their own unique way to make manifest electricity as electricity becomes present in the world through the uniqueness of each and every one of us. And to me, that's what it means to serve God. To me, that's what it means to be good, is to be who you are in the unique way that you share the implications of a life that demonstrates one soul, one God, one field of consciousness, one allness. Wow. Well, as one appliance... <laughs> to two other appliances, I believe. Oh, in you're cool. Ice cream I, you're and cool. Color red, color red and chocolate ice cream. I believe in them both, and I'd like to be a kettle. So my God is actually an air conditioner. This, this, this blew my mind. I will have to listen to this over and over to really absorb the wisdom that both of you shared with us to truly internalize it. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. I know that everybody out there feels the same. We are all. So, so grateful for everything that you shared today. Honestly, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you. thank you, Rabbi Thank Dave you so Garrett. much. And thank you, Sarah. And this, uh, I, I look forward so to more conversation like this. The world needs it. Oh, Absolutely. Same. Me too. This was wonderful. And thank you, Adrian, for being just so as much. always. You're the thank best. Thank you for Momentum that is doing such yes. a fabulous work. Such yes. an honor. Thank you, Rabbi David. Aaron and Sarah Hurwitz, you shared such honest insights and wisdom with us today.